Brown's Gas Can Change Your Life. It certainly changed the life of my guest, the great George Wiseman. I did tell you that I wanted to introduce you to some of the phenomenal people I met at the Greater Reset in Morelia, Mexico. Welcome to episode 103 of the Be Yourself and Love It podcast with me, Anthony Samaroff, in partnership with the Conscious Resistance Network. Hi, George. It's good to speak to you again. Um, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? You're an engineer. You've invented a bunch of stuff in the past and you like tinkering with things. Uh, I'm a little bit of an ivory tower intellectual myself, but uh, I like getting uh, my hands dirty when I can. So tell me how you got into this phenomenon of Brown's gas. Well, that's quite a story. <laughs> it just it is perfect. Um, okay, I'm an inventor, and I became an inventor because I uh, essentially the way I grew up and my proclivity. I, I'm uh, I happen to I, I I have to say this. I'm not trying to pat my own back, but they couldn't even measure my mechanical IQ. But just when they when they did a college exam uh, testing and stuff, so right. I I have a very good yeah. uh, modality for that. But yeah. I, I was raised on a cattle ranch way mm. back in the in what we call the bush. Uh, it's like a day's drive to go to town and back. Uh, so mom and dad would only do that once a month type thing. And it was an hour's bus ride to go to the little country school that I, I grew up in. There was no electricity, no running water, no plumbing, no any of that kind of stuff. It was a trapper's cabin that was the main ranch house that was built in the 1800s. So we, uh, we, we grew up like that. We hauled water. Uh, we didn't even have a well. We hauled water to uh, mm -hmm. uh, drink. So that, that's how I, I grew up. And then when I left the ranch and, and started traveling around in my 1966 Ford pickup truck, uh, it, it, which was getting 34 to 36 miles to the gallon, half ton truck. Now, I didn't know that pickup trucks were not supposed to get that kind of fuel mileage. <laughs> right. You didn't <laughs> even know. That's yeah. right, because when you're when you're growing up in a situation like that, there are no electricians or automotive mechanics or plumbers or doctors or lawyers or veterinarians or anything. If you want something done, you do it yourself or it doesn't get done. And our neighbors and us would help each other from time to time. But the nearest neighbor lived a mile away, which is like one point six kilometers. So the uh, it, we just pr pretty much independent and you and you learned you didn't throw anything away. You repurposed things. You you'd learn to do with what you had, and that's how I grew up. So, became very inventive. Now, once I got out into the world and I worked at odd, odd jobs and stuff, there there were people who wanted me to stay with them, uh, keep working with them because I did such a good job. Because the work ethic on the ranch, there weren't any coffee breaks, mm -hmm, there were mm -hmm, <laughs> or anything mm -hmm. like that. Uh, it, you worked from when you got up in the morning, which was about four. 4.30 in the morning, mom would get us out of bed and, and stoke the fires in the wood stove and warm things up and we'd go out and uh, do the chores. Sometimes that meant hiking uh, on skis or, or snowshoes as much as a mile to get to where the cattle were to fork out with with hand forks, where there's no baled hay, it was all loose hay, uh, say about four ton of hay to feed uh, 100 head of cattle and then, uh, and then hike back and then get ready for school and go off like that. So it, work ethic, when I, when I went to work in the mines, for example, the guys were really upset with me because I didn't take coffee breaks. They said, are you trying to show us up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. I didn't know what a coffee break was. <laughs> you were just used to it by this point. That's right. Yeah. I grew up, you, you did the work until the work was done or it was too right. too dark to work and which time you right. went to bed. So that, uh, that's kind of the way it was. So And, and I still work that way. Even, even harder at this moment, I got up at two o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. I do that most mornings uh, we go and then I work until 5 p.m. in the afternoon and then I spend some time with uh, personal time with my wife and stuff and in the evening and then sleep how can you possibly do it George hint brown's yes. gas don't That's give away any spoilers yeah uh, brown's gas even as we're yeah. talking or even as we're talking they say for, it's George sick he's got oxygen yeah. cannulas on but no I'm, I was gonna say for those who are watching <laughs> you're not an intensive care unit or anything like that for those who are just listening um John, uh, George has a, has gas coming in through his nose at the moment while he's speaking, and it's not laughing gas. I know I've done. I, I know I've done. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, we we kind of set it up with a little bit of suspense. I meant to say that when I met uh, in the intro, when I met George, he was uh, manning his Browns gas mach machine uh, stall. He was um, doing demos, and someone came over and asked me if I worked for his company, and I was like, uh, "Nah, I'm just a fan." And uh, this was literally after we just met for a few hours and had a little bit of conversation. But I feel like we jumped onto the same wavelength. You, for those of you who don't know yet, all will soon be revealed. You will find out what Brown's Gas is. This is just um, the preamble to whet your appetite. Yes, exactly. So where I came from and, and how I became an inventor. Mm -hmm. So I'm out in the world, I'm doing uh, jobs, going from one job to another, depending on uh, what happens. I'm a, I'm a young man at this point, ended up working in the mines. And then uh, I decided that uh, working for other people wasn't working for me. I wanted to uh, make more money than that. So I thought I'd be a prospector or an inventor. Mm -hmm. And I tried prospecting for a while and I didn't do too badly, but it was a lot of hard work. It was just mm -hmm. as work as being on the ranch. So I mm -hmm. decided, since everybody was commenting about how uh, how much mileage I was getting on this pickup truck, right. I decided I'd help people get better mileage. And then it, pretty soon I had people lined up the driveway and and uh, people uh, six weeks in advance to, uh, wanting to get their vehicles enhanced. And I just and I eventually, just to cut a long story short, wrote a book called The Carburetor mm. Enhancer Manual to tell right. people how to get better mileage on their vehicles. And uh, uh, do these and, fixes still work? Um, these yeah. kind of carburetor fixes. But am I right that almost no one, like less than 1% of people actually have these fixes on their vehicles at the moment even though they could be doing a lot more miles to the 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 gallon yeah so this this is one of the things that i picked up i did not know about you when we first met although i had heard you on a show before i was listening to you on the podcasting apps after we met and you talked about i don't mind going into conspiracy theory territory because it's not conspiracy theory anymore it's conspiracy fact <laughs> you said you said that you're almost certain or you're certain that the automotive companies know that these devices exist and that they work. We're uh, me from a kind of libertarian free market perspective, as I guess most of my audience says, um, we kind of tend to think that if something, you know, if an invention is good and it um, uh, performs well in the marketplace, so it'll spread like the internet, you know, like a, like a meme, like. Uh, and, and it won't, and it will be more widely adopted. Could you tell us a little bit about what you think stop stop that from happening? Why? Why? Well, I, 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 I know you've suppression. seen suppression. Yes, there's a yeah. direct uh, su suppression, and some of the stories that I have would raise the hair on the back of your neck. I'm telling you, but just to go over it really briefly, uh, one of the things I did was go to the patent re repository in uh, Moscow, Idaho, in the uh, United States, Idaho, and then. Uh, at the University of Idaho there. And in five years, re research of just five years back, I, fi I found 5,000 fuel saver patents. Right. 5,000 in just five years, okay? Wow. Not one of which is on the market. Right. Not one, okay? So that's one of the reasons that I wrote a book rather than patenting. I, I haven't patented any of my fuel savers. So right. the, uh, and then I was able to teach people how to do it themselves, because I couldn't do every vehicle in North America. Right, right. <laughs> I, was, I was having trouble just doing it in my little town. So right. the, uh, and, and as I then started selling the book, it wasn't too bad. Books cross international boundaries and everything, and anyone with a carburetor anywhere could do this, and that, that was working really well. And then I started selling kits. Now right. that was a big no-no. Okay. Selling information wasn't, it just, they didn't yeah, bother yeah. me. They, as we'll in the powers the, that yeah, be, the, right? The, the, the authorities, as they like to call themselves. Exactly. But when I started selling kits, I got severe uh, suppression in things like uh, seven government investigations of my business. From mm -hmm. There were various government agencies in Canada and the United States that mm -hmm. investigated my business. But all those investigations went for naught. They, they went to nothing because not one customer complained. Not one. Right. But they could waste your time. They could get you involved in the court system. They could make you have to fill out forms, respond to it. So, so the thing is, so, so you don't know how many people have been put in your position of trying to spread the technology to help people do it for themselves. 
uh, it could be any number. It certainly wouldn't hit the news. And while they go on about their concern from glo for global warming and things like that, um, they're they're repressing technologies that could help people use their fuel more efficiently. Of course, um, you know they ban things like Uber Pool, which uh, which allow people to share a taxi ride together, which would obviously take cars off the road. In Mexico. What happens is when you've got a, a, a main stretch of road, someone will just get a car or a minivan and go up and down the road picking up several people in the car. That would obviously save fuel, but that's you know illegal in Western countries because oh I'm sure it's not safe. Yeah, and and if that's and, and if you believe that the reason why they ban these things is because it's not safe, I've got some nice property in Mexico by with a nice view of the seaside to sell you. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting what's going on. You know, I heard of these uh, solar panel roof tiles, you know, te 10 years ago or something like that. And I thought, well, the main problem with solar is it just takes so much space. I naively thought that's the main main problem with solar. Uh, but 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 roof tiles don't don't take space. So that must catch on really quickly. If people can just replace the roof tile with solar with solar roof tiles, surely it's 10, 15 years ago, I haven't seen anyone with solar roof tiles, um, but maybe that really would um, pose a threat to centralized energy production. Uh, and that's why that um, technology has not come on far enough for mass market adoption. I don't know, I'm just hypothesizing. Yes, so the next thing that happened as far as the kits went when the uh, legal things were just falling through, because obviously my fuel savers worked and there was no complaining, was that the postal services in the United States and Canada at the same time, so this is an international okay. uh, uh, conspiracy. Okay. Coordinated. Exactly. Yeah. Stopped delivering my kits to my customers. Wow, okay? crazy. So this was back in the 90s. And then, and at that point, um, I was off writing another book and my, and my mail room well, if my customer didn't receive uh, the package within a month, it was just automatically we'd send out another one. Because occasionally, two or three times a year, mm -hmm. the postal service mm -hmm. would lose a package, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when I came back, all of these, like dozens and dozens of uh, customers hadn't received the second package. Right. And now I had to send out a third package. And in that one, because I could sue that, do that back in the day, I insured the package for three times its value. So I could get right. my money back, right? If they if they right. lost it again, well, it turns out. So then, in 30 days, I went in and I said, "Okay, no one has received it." They said, "No, you have to wait 90 days." So I was pretty much out of business at this point because I wasn't selling right. very much markup, and and so I had right. all this debt and and no money coming in. Wow, crazy! And, and so that was a that was a good suppression technique as far as that goes, and they'd already done that with other people like the fish carburetor and stuff as well. So anyway, in 90 days, here the story continues. In 90 days, I went and put in my insurance forms and every single one of those customers then received the third package three days before they received a letter asking them to sign that they received the package. So that, that package got delivered and so all my customers got their product, but I got no money because they sent these letters back saying that the insurance was invalid because the package was delivered. So look at that kind of uh, uh, thing. And I also knew because back in those days where I lived, which wasn't on the ranch anymore, but it was still out in the rural area a little bit, they had party lines. And right. so I had bought an entire party line, all the phones on it, so that I could have a private business line and stuff. And mm -hmm. it turns out that uh, I was having trouble with the phone line. And in those days, you could call an operator. And the operator let slip. Oh, there's somebody else on your line. Hmm. <laughs> oh no! Oh, my wow. phones were tapped, and uh, and it and so all these kind of things were happening back in those days. The point is, it led to the next thing, which um, everything started to switch from uh, carbureted vehicles to fuel injected vehicles, electronic mm -hmm. fuel injection. So at mm -hmm. that point, I needed fuel savers that would work with fuel injected vehicles as well as carbureted, and that's where Brown's gas came in because you put a little bit of Brown's gas into the air going into the engine and it vastly increases the efficiency of combustion. I can explain why if it, if it matters to anyone. It's, a, it's but, interesting to people, yeah. When, when you yeah. get to it, let, let, let's get into the, the, the weeds of this stuff. 
Okay, well, we can get it. I should have started. So I can get into those. I should have started this interview by asking, George, do tell me, how many miles do you do to the gallon these days? Do I get? Yeah, do you get to the gallon? I want to start with that question. I don't know. Because I drive a hybrid car and I just I'm mostly running on electricity, so I feel up my traitor. Tank. You traitor! The yeah, World I, Economic Forum I loves you right now. I fill up my gas tank here. about uh, twice a year, so oh, I have wow. I really have okay. no idea what my fuel mileage is nowadays. But but it's uh, what are you going to do? I've always wanted the hybrid. I was actually yeah. I was actually rebuilding a 1984 Volvo uh, station wagon 245 with all my technology on it. And I recently, even though I had many thousands of dollars into that car, I recently had it taken to the scrapyard because the project wasn't done and I have so many projects to do that I knew I couldn't get to it and I didn't have room in my yard anymore. So I, that that hurt my heart, I tell you, because oh, it was, yeah, yeah. I, I had so much invested in that mm. uh, time and energy and thought and, and stuff into that car. but. You got to you got to pick and choose, and I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm not a young man anymore, and I, yeah. I have all these things. So you look young. Let, well, yeah, I, <laughs> but more on that later, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is, with your talents, you know, as you said, you're particularly apt for this kind of mechanical engineering world. Uh, I, I'm pretty good at taking a lot of different concepts and simplifying them into linear fashion, even when they're non-linear they're all in a cobweb way so we've all got our per particular proclivities and uh, talents when you're when you've got there, there's so much that could be done with your talents that i guess you have to kind of decide which projects you prefer to work on and, and uh, you, you can't do everything alas that's so that's absolutely true in fact that was that's a tip a hint for all your inventors out there mm -hmm. i wasn't making any money and i was having a hard time feeding my family because I, I wasn't selling enough things back when I was starting mm -hmm. to be an inventor. And I realized that I was, I call it chasing butterflies. I'd, I'd be working on a project and then have another idea and start working on the next project without finishing the first one. And yeah. eventually I had many projects unfinished. So I had to stop and think, uh -huh. okay, I need money to feed my family. I take right. one project and I work right through it. And, the, and what I did was I any ideas I had, I would stop and write everything down that I had about that idea and I'd put it in a box and eventually mm. had a great uh, box full of these ideas and act, and I've lost the box. I don't know where it is, oh, <laughs> but, man. but back in the day, that's what saved me. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. made my business work because I was able right. to follow an idea all the way through to where it was making money. Do you never get to the point with an idea where you're like 80, 90% done and you're like, oh, I just can't. I'm I've lost my enthusiasm. I just can't face this project anymore. I, I, I want to put it on a break for a while and circle back to it in six months. That I, I, I can't say that I'm exactly like that, where I get tired of a project and have to put a pause on it. Uh, I've many times, however, had other projects that I had to work on or things in my life come up where I've had to set projects aside. I have, for example, uh, an over Unity Browns gas machine uh, down there half built that's been half built for at least 15 years wow it's been 15 years sitting there ready to be this is one of the projects i'm talking about uh but there's been so many things happening in my life during that time i just couldn't get back to it yes it was right. it was no it was only it was 2013 so it was all it's only been 10 years i i apologize 10 years 2013 i had to uh, set that project aside so i there's just so many things I like to work on and I and all of them and and then there's the things that I don't know if they will work or not as an inventor there's things I yeah. I I work on and 99% of the time I'm wrong so you, an right. inventor has to really be okay with being wrong a lot right <laughs> but that 1% that 1% yeah, exactly. that you get right you can now do something the world's never seen before Right. Yeah. A, a lot of trial and error is, in, uh, is involved. You, uh, As a piano player, I used to say to my students, you learn the right notes by hitting the wrong notes. No, but no, no, no amount of studying the text uh, separate from working on it um, is equal to actually sitting down and playing. Absolutely so right. Yeah. So. So then, like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so we're coming to the point where you discovered that if you inject, if you put a little Brown's gas into a 
um, fuel injected engine, it increases the mileage. Um, and you were, you, were, you were going to tell us a little bit about why that is. Yes, and it's important for later for health as well to understand this particular aspect of the Brown's gas. Because most of the fuels, the gasoline, petrol, diesel, are what they call hydrocarbons. So mm -hmm. they have carbons with hydrogens around them. And you have to break those in order for the fuel to combust. You have to break the fuel apart into its constituent atoms of hydrogen and carbon. And those bonds are very, very strong. So it takes a lot of energy to break those bonds apart. And then once the bonds are apart, the hydrogens can combine with oxygen to form H2O or water. And the carbons can form, combine with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. So then those are the, uh, if you have perfect combustion, that's, that's the uh, byproducts. But it has to break apart into its constituent atoms first. Okay, so how do you break apart those bonds? Normally you put an energy in, it can be a heat energy or an electrical energy, like a spark plug, this kind of stuff, to, to start breaking those bonds apart. And uh, when it, and that's called endothermic energy, the energy necessary to make the flame run. Once the flame gets started, it propagates. So they have propagation energy. In other words, they're taking heat from the flame to continue breaking apart the fuel molecules and that's called, again, part endothermic energy, all the energy necessary to go in to break it apart. So part of the uh, gasoline, or sorry, internal combustion engines are heat engines. So the more heat you can get from fuel, a liter of fuel or gallon, whichever measurement you're using, is it will make the vehicle go further down the road. So lessening the amount of the uh, propagation energy, the endothermic energy that's going in, gives you more exothermic energy or the heat energy that is left over after the uh, combustion is done. So that's what Brown's gas does. It acts like a catalyst. And when you put it in there, it lowers the amount of energy necessary to break apart the hydrogen carbon bonds. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and it lowers it enough that it overcomes the inefficiencies of, of producing the electricity necessary to do the electrolysis on board the vehicle. In other words, you're using uh, energy from your alternator to run the water splitting device, the electrolyzer that makes the Brown's gas, and then you're putting the Brown's gas into the engine. And if you were trying to use the Brown's gas as a fuel, a standalone hydrogen oxygen mixture, you would quickly just go dead. You'd drain your battery dead and that would be it because you couldn't get enough energy back out of the engine to keep the uh, uh, alternator running uh, to produce enough energy to make the gas that runs the engine that that's just not possible. But you can make enough gas to enhance the combustion of the regular carbon-based fuel and make it go a lot further on a gallon of gas. So that's that's essentially the, the reason that it works. So anytime you go beyond that amount of fuel, or, or excuse me, Brown's gas that you need for to enhance the combustion, you get into that negative thing. So the, more is not better. As you put in more Brown's gas, uh, you end up with a negative cycle and you could end up losing mileage. So you have okay. to find that optimal, optimal. Uh, sweet spot for any particular engine. And I've determined all of that. It's in the books. So that would be what I call my Hyzor technology, if you were on my website and buying the uh, that particular onboard electrolyzer. So then it then it proceeds. I'm, I'm selling fuel savers, but I originally bought the Brown's gas or did the Brown's gas research because I actually wanted a torch, a Brown's gas or hydrogen oxygen torch in my workshop because as an inventor, I build things that aren't on the shelf. So I, I learn all kinds of welding techniques and stuff. And they said that Brown's gas could weld tungsten to plastic. And I thought, that's neat. I want that. It's a myth, by the way. It doesn't do that. <laughs> but, okay, okay. Well, but at least you found out from first-hand experience. Yeah, so these are the rumors that are floating around. Okay. Anyway, they I couldn't afford to buy a Browns gas machine then because at that point they were selling machines that large were selling for three hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Wow. So I could I, I couldn't afford that. I was trying to feed my family. But I'm an inventor and I understand electrolysis, so I did all the research I could on Browns gas and I built my own. Brown's gas electrolyzers, which now people can do if they buy my book, Brown's gas uh, book one and book two, they can build the electrolyzers that I built. And had uh, it, it turned out, well, I could afford to do that. And it turned out that my electrolyzers, when I finally started to sell them, were half the weight, half the size, and produced the same volume of gas with half the electricity. 
because of my alternative energy research that I put in there, as well as the uh, regular electrolysis that uh, was making the Brown's gas. So all of this was good. Uh, and so after I had one in for my own shop, then I sold extras that repaid all of my uh, research expenses and stuff like that. So I ended up uh, repaying the, the uh, it actually cost me almost a quarter million dollars by the time <laughs> all this research was done, but it all got repaid in the uh, sale of the machines. And then the next step was, and this was in about 1993, 94, people started to uh, experiment with bubbling the Brown's gas in water and feeding it to plants. And the plants did really well. The plants, uh, if they were in dirt, they'd, they'd grow about three times faster. And if they were in uh, hydroponics, about 10 times faster. They'd mature 10 times faster. So th this was really good for the people that were using it. And then a guy who learned about this plant health thing decided to bubble it in water and put the Brown's gas bubbled water on a cotton ball in a plastic cap on a melanoma on his forehead. And in three weeks' time, that melanoma was gone. Has he got now, different afterwards, afterwards pictures? pictures? Yeah, I, I, not on that one, but the, but it's been duplicated other times. And I do on the uh, aquacure.life website, there's pictures that people can see where the uh, in Germany, this guy did essentially the same thing, only they put a shower cap on his head and put the Brown's gas into the shower cap as a gas instead of just the bubbled liquid. And essentially the same thing. And then there's... Uh, another guy, a uh, uh, podcaster, that his mother had a melanoma on her forehead and did, and they did the bubbled water uh, cotton ball thing on her. And again, three weeks time, it was it was gone in that case as well. The skin just healed up and uh, the melanoma scabs type, type things just peeled right off and it was, it was gone. So this is, but it, but at first in 96, I didn't believe this guy. And I apologize right, right. publicly. I apologize that I didn't believe him. But I did tell my customers, here's something that is being done. Uh, and then I started to get testimonials coming in, coming in, coming in from people using Brown's gas for health. And mm -hmm. the, But it took until 2005, okay, from 1996 to 2005, before they convinced me to bubble my distilled water with Brown's gas and drink it myself. Nine years, wow, okay. Wow of these testimonials coming in before they convinced me because I knew it to be uh, a non-toxic gas, but it, mm -hmm. I, I was I was working with it with combustion, internal right, combustion, right. external combustion, torches, all these kind of things. I, I, who would think of using a fuel as a health, uh, mm -hmm. for health, right? You know about gasoline, you don't like drink it or anything. <laughs> it's like, or petrol, you, you uh, anyway, it was it was good, and so from 2005 to 2007, I used it myself, and I didn't get sick. So, this was good. Let me go on. Yeah. Here's a hypothesize as to why the Brown's gas affected the melanoma in the way that it did. Um, mainly, it increases the efficiency of your own immune system. This, okay. this is a hypothesis. I, I'm not a uh, MD, a candidate doctor, or any, so I don't know exactly, but but when you apply the Brown's gas to yourself externally, either by liquid or gas, you decide what part of your body gets the gets the attention of the gas. And if you ingest the water by drinking it or inhale the gas, like I'm doing right now, then your body decides where it goes. So if they'd have been ingesting it, uh, the melanoma may not have gotten cured right away. It may have been something that that happened uh, uh, happened in the progress later, as the body healed itself. Because the body will go to and start healing the most important things that it considers to be the most important first. But these people applied it externally directly, and I think what happened was that the cells, which were misbehaving, stopped misbehaving. They right, just simply because right. that's what cancer is. It's like an uncontrolled growth of uh, of cells that should be doing apoptosis in itself, killing themselves. So, uh, and I think the reason why is because it isn't getting they aren't getting the nutrition that they need. See, right, our bodies right. are sixty two percent hydrogen by volume, twenty four percent carbon, twelve sorry twenty four percent oxygen, twelve percent carbon, and two percent everything else. So the body needs this macronutrition of hydrogen. And if it's not getting it, then things just start to go haywire. And your, uh, first of all, your uh, regeneration systems fail. So instead of uh, 
having stem cells. And for example, if you get a cut, uh, you'll scar. And I, I, I even had a scar, a large scar here on my forehead at one time. And then as, uh, as I started to inhale, that scar faded away. It took about six to 10 months. And, uh, and I, I no longer have any scars on my body because my regeneration system turned back on. Right, Next thing, right. and, 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 and previously, you were unable to heal these things because let's say the, the body has a hierarchy of things that it needs to do, you know, uh, um, maybe it wants to take out the trash, so to speak, from all your cells and things like that. And when it's so busy, just with the regular process of uh, breathing and ingesting energy from food and the, um, the, the metabolic process is creating more metabolic waste and taking it out through the back passage in the urine, the skin. Um, when the body's so busy cleaning itself, it doesn't, it can't prioritize the kind of healing that it can when, say, uh, like a, a more moderate version um, of uh, giving the body a break would be like to go on a juice cleanse and then say, let's say fast, drinking only water. All of a sudden people start healing things on these kind of detox protocols that they can't even do when they're eating every day because 50% of our energy goes to digestion. It seems like this Brown's gas method completely bypasses all of that and just lets this primary nutrient hydrogen into the blood, uh, into the body via the bloodstream. If you, if you breathe it through the, the stom stomach, the, the alimentary canal, if you drink it, or you, of course you could rub it on the skin. And then you and and then the the blood takes the hydrogen to wherever the body thinks it, it needs to go, and it will start taking care of those things in the order that it, it's capable of. Yeah, that's that's a good in a nutshell uh, synopsis. And the Brown's gas has something that uh, enhances it even further. The Brown's gas is mostly hydrogen, and there's a lot of hydrogen for health uh, um, information out there right now. And everything that hydrogen for health can do, Brown's gas can do as well and better because brown's gas also contains a third gas which i discovered in 1996 um, that i call electrically expanded water this is a very important constituent of brown's gas and what makes it separate from what is otherwise called oxyhydrogen so mm -hmm. if you have two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen and you have a mixed gas like that we call it oxyhydrogen but it doesn't contain this third gas now this third mm -hmm. gas is uh, is formed only in Brown's gas electrolyzers. As far as I know, I know no other way to form it. And it's formed in electrolyzers that have no membrane in the middle. And so what there's essentially what's called an electron bridge that forms between the anode and cathode, the negative and positive uh, um, plates or electrodes. And as the electrons go across, they start stuffing electrons into actual water, H2O molecules. Mm -hmm. So the H2O uh, get uh, like a sponge soaks up water. These uh, water is soaking, soaking up electrons until it becomes a gaseous form of water that is not water vapor or steam. Also negatively charged because it's got ele electrons and electrons have a negative charge. So you end up with a negatively charged plasma, cold plasma form of water. And this cold plasma is a third gas that comes out and it's significant portion of Brown's gas too, like 30 to 40% of the gas could actually be this electrically expanded water if you have a well-designed electrolyzer. So we have a situation where I was getting 130% gas. Now I knew that from the early, uh, late 18, 1980s and early 1990s, but I, and I theorized like in Brown's gas book one, what it could possibly be, I was wrong, okay? I've since corrected that. Uh, mm -hmm. What it actually was, it, because 130% means that I was getting 30% more gas than 100% theoretically possible using the Faraday equations of electrolysis. So right. if I put a certain number of amperage in, I should get a certain amount of gas out. And right. I was getting 30% more gas than was theoretically possible. So in 1996, I made a small electrolyzer that was completely transparent so I could see everything that was happening inside it. And I saw this gas being generated I saw hydrogen coming off the uh, cathode and oxygen coming off the anode, just like it's supposed to. But then I saw a third gas, a third gas, so much gas, it was like another plate coming right out of the middle of the gas, uh, out of the middle of the solution, having no connection to the electro, uh, electrodes at all. So this third gas was coming out and all three of those gases then would come out the same hose 
what uh, William Rhodes, the original inventor of what we now call Brown's gas, back in the early 1960s, he called it the single ducted gas. Now, he mm -hmm. didn't know about this extra gas that was coming out. That was something I discovered later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole story on that. But in any case, it's very important to know that this electrically expanded water is part of Brown's gas because it has these bioavailable electrons. Now, mm -hmm. people that are sick generally have used up their energy reserves or se severely tapped, tapped on them, and their energy generation systems are often a compromise, which is what you were saying. Like even when you're doing a digestion, a lot of your energy goes to making that happen. So mm -hmm. as you pointed out, the Brown's gas bypasses all of that. So you're getting not only the hydrogen that you need, but you're getting the energy that you need directly without your digestive system or anything like that. You, you're actually, in this case, I'm inhaling the gas. I'm inhaling that bio uh, available electrons directly into my body. And it's just uh, going with my blood everywhere that my body would need energy to go without any having to do with digestion. In fact, I only eat once a day. Mm -hmm. And and then I have to do portion control and have a very small portion. So I try to eat very flavorful, very um, uh, nutritious food, be, and I and I it and I chew every bite a lot because it's only a little food. <laughs> mm -hmm. Else mm -hmm. else I can't lose weight. Okay, I still right. have ten pounds I'd like to lose. Okay, so you're yeah. living on hydrogen. Just about yes. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Okay. I see. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. So, what what you did not uh, count on was uh, all the health, all the potential health benefits. Okay, because the fir at first people were just drinking Brown's gas, which they dissolved in water. But later they took the next step. Crazy! How could they think of doing it? of actually breathing it directly into their lungs. Could you tell us a little bit about that story? Oh man, yes. That's another place where I was wrong. I was very, mm. very wrong. Okay, now I'm drinking the, the uh, water and I'm telling people that they can drink the water. And I actually built a, an electrolyzer that we call the ER50, as in Eagle Research, 50 liters per hour. So mm. the um, we had this electrolyzer that we were putting out that was uh, for a little micro torch and I redid it so that people could bubble the, uh, uh, water and then people and I sold many thousands of these ER50s and people they were bubbling the water and reporting the health gains and many of them started asking can we inhale the gas can we breathe it and I'm thinking this is an oxygen hydrogen mixture which is one of the most explosive gases uh, mixtures on earth and I'm thinking it's not a good idea to inhale something that could explode in your lungs Totally, there's no, it's totally non-toxic. There's no way to have a, a toxic anything. You could inhale the gas theoretically instead of air and be perfectly mm -hmm. healthy, except for this little tiny thing where if it, if it explodes, you're, all of a sudden you're, you're uh, all the uh, little, little uh, sacs, in, little air pockets in your lungs explode and, and you, the blood flows and out your nose and mouth and you suffocate on your blood. I, this is the kind of things that were running in my head. I didn't want anybody to have that happen to them. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, and that was from uh, 2007, people were asking. So in in uh, 2016, December of 2015, um, excuse me, December of 2015, uh, one of my customers said, you're saying not to inhale, but look at this. And he sent me a picture or video of a Korean hydrogen bar that was had a brown gas machine, several brown wow. gas. And people were going in and paying like we pay for a cup of coffee. Yeah, like, like hookah. It inhal inhalation. And I looked at that machine, which I knew it was an Epoch machine, those, those hydrogen uh, Brown's gas machines. And I realized, oh, geez, here I am. I am an internal and external combustion expert. And I didn't think of why it would work. It works because they were producing the gas at a rate that was the people were inhaling under the lower combustible limit of the gas. In other words, like anyone who, who understands automotive mechanics, if you don't have enough fuel going into the engine and the spark plug fires, it won't fire. There's fuel there, but not enough. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. They were, in, they were inhaling at a lower than combustible limit, so it was perfectly safe. Hmm. And hmm. again, perfectly therapeutic as well. So that, at that point, uh, I was a 24-7 caretaker of my late wife. 
uh, in December mm. of 2015. So I wasn't able to further those experiments until in March of 2016 when she passed away. And uh, that was a that was a really hard time mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. life. I have never experienced mm -hmm. pain like that in my life. And I've mm -hmm. had all mm -hmm. kinds of bones broken and everything. It's just like it was it was indescribable. And I know I now can understand why people can say there's no words because there are mm -hmm. no words. in any case. I'm sitting on the couch because I, I I was sleeping on the couch because I never slept in our marriage bed again. I mm -hmm. uh, I uh, and I look over beside me because I pretty much was just living on the couch except for when I had to get up to uh, pee or something. Uh, and I looked over beside me at this ER50 Brown's gas machine that was the bubbling the water I would drink, and I thought, you know what, I'm I'm going to experiment. With, I'm going to put the cannulas on this machine. I rigged it up so it would do a safe level of uh, Brown's gas. And I videotaped myself that very first time, just in case there was an explosion or something and I, and uh, people could see what my lunacy was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so people can go into my YouTube channel and they can see that I had a snow white mustache and beard and I, I had uh, pure white hair. I, it's all gray again now. You can't see in the videos very well, but hair is growing back on my head. My wife just mm. uh, pointed that out. Uh, by the way, I have a, a new wife, a new life. I am mm. I am enjoying this new life very much. But at that time, things were a very, very hard time for me. So right. in any case, I uh, I started to inhale and um, and I inhaled. I, 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 nothing happened bad. So I just kept inhaling and I was sitting on the couch anyway. Uh, so uh, I, but I did have to start inhaling in the mornings at first there because uh, I inhaled for 15 minutes that first time and I didn't sleep all night. I was absolutely awake and alert all night, which is one of the reasons I inhale the can we lose my cannulas every time I sit down at the computer because I, my mind just stays alert without any coffee right. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And even when I travel, like it's 13 hours to go travel to our daughter-in-law, which we visit occasionally, and I drive straight through 13 hours, no coffee or anything. I just I put the Brown's gas machine in the back seat and uh, and inhale the Brown's gas as I'm driving, and it just works. Keep me awake and alert all the way. Just boom, no problem. So the uh, here I am. I suddenly start to get all these health benefits, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm astonished. Now I'm only inhaling the gas to prove that it's safe. I did not expect that uh, I would get these various health benefits. That over time, first of all. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain some of them. I don't even remember them all. I have them listed in uh, my story at, on the aquacure.life website. But uh, so you can go and look for yourself. But some examples are uh, I started to drink the water back in 2005 and uh, I didn't get sick anymore and pretty much haven't never gotten sick since. I, I had a cold or a flu for maybe a day or two, occasionally, maybe four times in all of those years. But that's it. So the... Uh, mm -hmm. But all the other uh, things that, that were aging were still happening. I was drinking the water, but my neuropathies were in, like I'd lost a feeling in the palm of my left hand and from my knees to my feet and the fronts of my shins, totally lost feeling in the skin. I had uh, tinnitus that was getting worse to the point I could hardly hear people speak. I had uh, um, obviously I was losing my hair and it was turning white. I had uh, psoriasis uh, that was really bad. I had warts. Uh, I had, I'll probably think, I had a heart murmur from when I was a child and warts from when I was a child. So the first thing I noticed was that my psoriasis, the, the thick white peeling skin and, and uh, stuff I had uh, started to peel off like a snake, a snake skin peeling off. And I and and that was very disconcerting. You have large portions of your skin just start to peel off. But underneath it was, it didn't, it wasn't painful. And underneath it was baby, smooth, beautiful skin underneath mm -hmm. there. And I, I thought, okay, I, I can handle that. And then other things started to happen. So I, I told people, yes, it was safe to inhale the gas. And about three months into that, uh, one customer got back to me and said, in three weeks time, her lupus symptoms were gone. Oh. Yes, you know, you know the story. I, I, and I'll, I I'll, I'll, I tell, tell it fairly quickly here because it's a hard one for me. My late wife, who at the time I said I was a 24-7 caretaker, could not even roll over in bed without assistance. She'd lost her hair. She was blind. 
uh, the lupus uh, was had, had pretty much taken away all of her quality of life to the point where I was carrying her to the toilet and she would beg me, to, three times she begged me to just let her go because she could see how hard it was for me. It isn't mm. just the person that's sick that suffers, it's all the people around them that are caring for them that suffer as well. So, and I couldn't be away from her for more than 20 or 30 minutes at a time, 24 seven, there was no one else to help me, that was it. So that was my life at the time. And when she passed, obviously there was a large burden lifted off my uh, shoulders, and, and but I didn't do anything. I just sat there on the couch mm. because Breathing. I couldn't do anything. My, my life disappeared with this woman. Every, all our hopes and dreams and everything were gone. Uh, and I didn't know it at the time, but I had to make a new life, and and I have since done that. But at the time, I didn't care if I lived or died, and mm. and so I, I I was willing to breathe a gas that I thought might even hurt me. I I didn't know. Right. So, but I always do things for myself first. I made my own fuel savers, then I teach people. I made my own torches. I teach people. So anyway, I I did this for myself, and even drinking the water, I did it for myself before I recommended it to people. So in any case, it it turns out that my late wife had a severe form of lupus. So having this woman said that her lupus symptoms, yeah. which we had battled for 10 years and she had gotten this bad, were gone in three weeks time, that just knocked the feet right oh. out from under me. I I was literally laying on the carpet, I don't know for how long, crying because I, I thought, I, I'm an expert with Brown's gas. I'm, I've been working with Brown's Gas since 1986. I had all these people giving me testimonials all this time. I should have listened. It took me nine years from 1996 to 2005 to even drink the bubbled water. And then I was drinking the bubbled water and my wife didn't drink the bubbled water because she was afraid of it because uh, it raised the uh, the pH to about eight and, and her sister-in-law told her, who was a, who was a science teacher in, in, uh, in college, told her that that was not good water to drink. So my, my wife didn't do any of the Brown's gas at all, not even drinking the water. But when this woman reported back, I thought this gas, if she'd have been able to, to have it at that time, if I had been quicker and, and learned some enough stuff that my wife could have possibly, it could have saved her. Yes. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't even get up. I couldn't stop until I realized that I had to make it my mission to help as many people as possible. This is this is the only way I could get up off the floor. Right. right. Not suffer like we did. I want is yes. I want Brown's gas in every home. Doesn't have to be my machine. I think I make the world's best machine, but it, it doesn't have to be my machine. And it doesn't even have to be Brown's gas. Even hydrogen will help. Brown's gas right. is better, right. but hydrogen in every home. I made it my mission, and I've and that was in 2016 and I have worked long hours seven days a week since then to make it happen and it's platforms like you I am very grateful that you're you're spreading the word to, to help me help other people get this benefit of extended healthful life getting rid of these things one of the most beautiful things about my life right now is I don't have any pain another thing was arthritis I have full functionality mm -hmm. and strength in my hands again where I had I had pain and uh, weakness before. Uh, I I can't even remember all the things that are, that have happened. But even four years in, I remember because it, it it some things take a long time to uh, to heal or reverse or whatever. And I was in the shower showering, and uh, I I suddenly realized I was washing my toes, uh, standing like a stork on one foot and washing my toes without leaning against the shower wall. Right, right. I I had. It was, I, I didn't remember when I didn't have to lean against the shower wall. I'd regained my balance. It was right, incredible. Right, right. When I, incredible. I suddenly had that realization. Yeah. So you, yes, you had some? Yes, yes yeah. amazing. Uh, I've recently experienced the same thing, by the way. I uh, had extremely tight muscles growing up, and I actually reported it to my girlfriend after treatment. I was like, wow, that's the first time I've been able to stand on one leg and soap the bottom of my foot. Um, so uh, based on your experience and my experience, I feel like we're at a juncture with planet Earth at the moment here where we could really go in the healing direction if knowledge of these sorts of technologies gets to people 
and the, 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 exactly the kind of thing that I want to bring to people's attention on this show, not just focusing on what's wrong with the world, which there's plenty of, but how we can take health and healing and the evolution uh, to the next, to the into our own hands and bring that forward. Um, I've got a query for you then. We've heard of people treating lots of things with Brown's gas. Have you any heard anything about you know some of the the really difficult to say, um, conditions like Parkinson's or Lyme's disease? Um, have you heard from from people who are suffering with those and what effects they might have benefited from Brown's gas? Yes, uh, and there's a lot of cancer out there now too. And, okay. and I'm getting testimonials almost every day from people who are uh, he have healed themselves from uh, really serious ailments like that. Uh, one of them that is it, like, oh, there, there's so many. I, I just they started flitting through my mind just there. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of them that I really appreciate was a young woman in her 20s. Uh, her father heard about Brown's gas and begged a fellow in Australia. Uh, who had one for his own personal self uh, to, uh, to to use the machine for his daughter because his daughter had been sent home. She's in her 20s and she's sent wow. home to die. The, the allopathic medicine said, we, we've done everything we can for you. Uh, make your make your will, make, do, do your uh, what you need to do. Uh, we, we can't do anymore. So this man got the Browns gas for his daughter and in a very short time, even a couple of months, uh, it had made such an improvement that they bought a machine of their own and and uh, gave the loaner back to the to the fellow, um, and he uh, and in I think it was six maybe eight months at the most sent a testimonial over to this fellow, who who then referred it on to me. She was one hundred percent cancer free. Amazing, amazing. These are the kinds of things that are happening. And of course, it isn't the same for everybody and everybody is different. And I'm not an MD and I'm not prescribing and I, and I have to say these legal things. <laughs> yes. But, and I, I, but have you I, have you had cases where people used it consistently and didn't notice a difference? Or is it people who don't don't actually use it that say that? Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Have you come into contact with cases where people use the machine uh, consistently and don't report a difference oh yeah yes yeah there there have been people that say they've used the machine consistently i wasn't there so i don't know for mm -hmm. sure uh and return the machine for a refund and because i have a one year satisfaction guarantee you can you can use it for a year and still return it and get your money back mm -hmm. we want to help people and some things take a while months weeks months to uh to, to show up so people can know that they made a good investment and right. when when i um had uh, we were helping my wife when she died i was three hundred thousand dollars in debt i'd maxed out all the credit cards did mortgages did everything that i could to to uh, buy the treatments that we were trying to do to uh, save this woman and mm -hmm. and and most of those things i wasn't getting my money back no. I didn't want that to happen with anyone who was trying our Aquacure machines. If they, if it doesn't work for you, I will give you your money back um, at, up to a year. So in any case, um, it's a one in a thousand. One in a thousand sends it back because they say it didn't work for them. Right. Well, I mean, you've done a pretty good job of Telling the story arc of uh, Aquacare, of the Aquacare, how the Aquacare product came into being. Um, are there any other anecdotes you'd like to share with us? We're coming on an hour anyway, and as much as I enjoy talking to you, um, I feel like I, I feel like we've we've shot for the bullseye. <laughs> okay, first of all, there's so much more to say. It's like uh, I tried to squeeze a three-hour presentation into the one you saw in, in Mexico, and it didn't right. work. But uh, right. So we'll have to talk at another time. I was going You're to... You're always welcome how... back on the show, George. Yes. You were going to ask about... Oh, I was going to ask how much more time we had, but the, the, and coming back on is a great idea. And would you like to do a part two? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm quite sure people will want to know why Brown's gas works, which is a, oh. a whole kind of a show in itself. Oh, well, that sounds fantastic. I would love to do that with you. So for now, 
why don't you tell people um, how they can get a brown gas machine if they want to, and um, uh, then we'll do then then we'll uh, tantalise people with the prospect <laughs> of a second hour. That sounds wonderful. Okay, so if they go to AquaCure, Aqua like water, A Q U A, Cure Q U R E dot life. I, I like I like that dot life instead of dot com or dot org or something because we're we're dealing with life here. So aquacure dot life, right. and you'll be able to see my story, and uh, and you can click on a button which will take you to Eagle Research where you can actually purchase the aquacure machine of your own, and uh, see the various options. Uh, for those people that travel, we even have an option that goes with uh, 120 volts or 240 volts uh, instead of just the 240 volt model or something. All right. Excellent. Yeah. OK, very good. So you can see George's website at aquacure.life. Um, you can connect with If you do decide to get a Browns gas machine, please email me at anthony at beyourselfandlover.com because I'd really like to hear that you did that and I want to know what benefits you get from it. And you can also book me for counseling or personal coaching at beyourselfandloveit.com. Until next time, be yourself, but don't just be yourself. Be yourself and love it. And I can't think of a better way to empower you to do that than to get a Browns gas machine in your house and treat your nearest and dearest to more energy, healing, and vitality. See you next time. Okay. How'd you?